Good afternoon. Uh, I'm E. Gijinikos Mikinik Quay. I'm delighted to have you with us today. Um, thank you for being here for the National Indian Health Board's conference. I am a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. My native name is Turtle Woman. My Anglo name is Stacy Bolin, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of the National Indian Health Board. In February of this year, President Biden formed a COVID-19 equity task force. The mission of the task force is to provide specific recommendations to the President of the United States for mitigating inequities caused or exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and for preventing such inequities in the future. We have two very um, exciting guests with us today to talk about the work of the task force. One is the chairman of the task force, the chairwoman of the task force, and the American Indian Alaska Native representative to that body. Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith is Associate Dean for Health Equity Research. She is, she is the CNH Long Professor of Medicine, Public Health and Management, and Director of the Equity Research and Innovation Center at Yale. Her research focuses on health and healthcare equity for marginalized populations, with an emphasis on the social and structural determinants of health, the influence of healthcare systems on health disparities, and the advancement of community academic partnered scholarship. Dr. Nunez Smith currently serves as senior advisor to the White House COVID-19 response team and chair of the Presidential COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Dr. Nunez Smith, thank you for being with us today, Miigwech. Thank you so much, I'm thrilled to be here, thank you. And Victor Joseph, Victor Chairman Joseph, serves on the White House COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Mr. Joseph was elected by the 42 member tribes to the position of Tanana Chiefs, Chief Chairman in, in March of 2014 and served through October of 2020. As the Chief Chairman, he was the Principal Executive Officer for the corporation and presided over all corporate meetings of the member tribes. Prior to being elected to the Tanana Chiefs Council, Chief Chairman Victor was employed as the Chiefs Council Health Director from 20, 2007 to 2014. He has been working in this area in leadership positions for over 28 years. He is also serving as the Alaska Representative on the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Secretary's Tribal Advisory Committee and on the Indian Health Service Budget Formulation Committee. Chairman Joseph is a tribal member of the native village of Tanana. He has extensive experience building strong working relationships with tribal leaders, colleagues, staff, funding agencies, and corporate beneficiaries. And he is the American Indian Alaska Native representative to this esteemed panel about health equities and achieving equity through COVID-19. And those of you who know Chairman Joseph know, he's also one of the most powerful, effective, and recognized public speakers on the issue of water, running water, access to water and sewage for Alaska Natives and for um, American Indians in the lower 48. Thank you for being with us today. Great being here, Stacy. Looking forward to the conversation today. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today too. The two of you have served on this panel together for almost a year now and um, I look forward to asking questions, but also to just seeing the interplay of the work you've done together and what might be what you might be inspired to discuss with us today. So first for Dr. Nunez Smith, you were appointed to lead the task force to address one of the most immediate and critical needs in this country. When you were asked to do this, what were your aspirations for what this task force this task force could achieve? Wow, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and you know, before I even turn to, to that, I do want to just take a, a moment to say how grateful I am for Mr. Joseph, who um, I just am so lucky to work with in this space. I mean, you know, I I um I leaned in as you did that introduction because I was like, oh my goodness, how fortunate, what a gift, right, to have all of that expertise and wisdom. And I was waiting for you to say, and he's just a really wonderful, nice human being because he is. And I, 
just so grateful because even in the shaping of the aspiration and what it could be and the work, like I have sought counsel um, from Mr. Joseph and he is patient with the time differences, right? To hear and understand and say, how can we set our work in a way that will be difference making, that will be transformative for all of us. And, you know, I think that's where I would start is saying the vision with the task, it's we work, it is shared um, and it is shared among us. I mean, it is an incredible group of people. I, um, you know, I have to pause to think if I've ever been in a group that has been so united and committed to mission, um, tireless, passionate, right? I mean, just deep, deep uh, change making, but in the most kind of collaborative way. And so, you know, the, the president was very clear to us with the charge. Um, this was something that he signed into being his first full day in office, an executive order creating this task force. Uh, the national strategy for fighting COVID um, goal six is was really all about equity and advancing health equity in COVID-19. Um, and so even doing the transition, that was a top priority for you know, the president and vice president elect to make sure that we were going to be centering on equity in the work. Um, I think it's really remarkable uh, where we have come you know, since the very first meeting. We, we just recently had the seventh public facing meeting where we voted on our final recommendations. Um, a real comprehensive 300 plus of them. Uh, but also noting that of those recommendations, um, at least 57% of them have already been fully implemented by the Biden Harris administration or are in process. So sort of real time influence and work informing the response, even as we're thinking about recovery and resilience preparedness moving forward. But, you know, I was so excited to come here today because I don't get enough opportunity to say thank you to my friend, Mr. Joseph, for your leadership on the task force. Thank well, you. thank you for that. Richard, would you like to talk about, or obviously the, you probably want to respond and then of course I'll jump right in with some more questions. Ah, oh, she's right. So well, it's all good. <laughs> so anyway. You're such a nice man. You're such a yeah. wonderful tribal leader to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the good guy part. You need to hold on to that one. But really, um, I, I, I just want to recognize Dr. New Smith as well. I mean, her leadership is what molded this task force together and drove us to the results we had. It was said yesterday that we achieved in seven months what would normally take two and a half years to do. That was the type of commitment from the task force, uh, from all the HHS staff, the contractors, and volunteers that came in and did presentations. And so it was really well organized. Um, as we're looking at, and I can't say as enough about just how important that group of people and how well they work through all the issues. And it wasn't always easy discussion, you know? As the, initially, as the only travel member to the task force, I had a lot of concerns. In fact, when Dr. Nuna Smith called me, it was like, Oh no, really? And I wanted to run, you know, and that was, and I told her that I will uh, call you back in a little bit. And finally, uh, I, I said, and I think I talked to you, Stacy, and I talked to Vernell, uh, Verne, and really I just asked, you know, some for some support and stuff. You all said you would, and that helped me say, okay, because I, there was a couple things I wanted to make sure it happened that we kept our strong voice and our issues were consistent with the messaging across the board. I didn't want to be saying something over here that was conflictual with what we're seeing at Stack or what NIHB's position our, our A and HB. And so that was really important to me that we just stayed consistent. But when we're looking at priorities, we had a lot of priorities it, through Indian country and we still do. But it was how do we bring those priorities together with all the other priorities and all the other inequities from all the other groups of people that have been impacted by COVID-19. And there was a lot. And so we wanted to stay consistent. We wanted to make sure that we were working collaboratively together and that we molded those messaging correct. And so I think that was what was really the most positive thing. And once again, it was because of our chairwoman 
she did a fabulous job and she put fabulous people into co-chair positions and it took commitment. We were meeting sometimes uh, three, four times a week, at, depending on what it was, just because that's what it was taking to get it done. And then there was a lot of work being done uh, outside of the committees. And so it was just a lot and it was a job well done. I'm, I'm happy with the results. I'm just very glad that you said yes, Mr. Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about running, believe me. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Uh, well, we're really glad that you said yes, too. So now that you have been down the road with this task force for a while, how has your vision of what is possible and what is needed changed since the beginning, since you first embarked on this journey? This is for both of you. Mr. Joseph, please feel free. Okay. Well, you know, it, thinking a lot about this is over, over since when it first started, my priorities were shifting over time. It was depending on what was the emergent response at the moment in time. So initially when I first got it, we were still worried about uh, PPE. We were worried about testing and everything like that. And then became vaccinations. And then how were we gonna resolve that? And what were the issues around vaccinations as far as distrib uh, distribution and making sure that people that were uh, hesitant are not wanting to get the vaccines because of concerns that they were getting the right information so that they can make an informed decision. We're very worried about the politics that were kind of involved in everything in, in those type of decisions. But overall, we were trying to make sure and we wanted to make sure that messaging was out going out correctly. Today, when I'm looking at some of the issues and some of the priorities that were being addressed, um, I had a discussion with Dr. Newton Smith a while back about testing. Recently, my, uh, my tribal community was impacted and we found out we were still sh having shortages of testing media. And that's just not okay right now. You know, We need to be able to test people to make sure that they're not spreading this disease. And, and be able to recommend. And so there's a lot of areas that we discussed and moved forward. I can get into each of those little items, but overall it was a real collective group. And I just like the way we put it together through the four committees and the themes of each one of those months that Dr. Newsmith will talk a little bit about. Yeah, no, I, yeah, no, if I, if I may, and, and, um, you know, to say, that there is so much in the work of the task force that is about kind of unification around a set of values and principles, right? What, what you just said is so right. Like, it's not okay, right? I mean, that's the fundamental, that's it. That's the whole thing, right? It's not okay. It's not okay that we always know and we've come to accept who is going to get harmed first? Who's going to get harmed worse? That's just the way of being, the status quo. It's not okay. Um, and the work of the task force is to say that and to say, to scream it, right? It's not okay. And then to talk about where those remedies are. Um, you know, one of these, this question of resources, I think is so important. I want to just linger there for a minute, right? Let me talk about having equitable access to all of the life-saving, life-preserving resources that are needed in COVID-19 pandemic time. And that includes, right, to Mr. Joseph's point, testing. Um, and I think, you know, the, the administration, I will always say, because I am here with, with these different hats on, and it's been a privilege to also work as senior advisor to the White House COVID-19 response team. And I will say, you know, the administration is aware there is more work to do, but, but it is because of the, the advocacy of champions like Mr. Joseph that we have seen resources, um, at least I think an important, you know, down payment and deposit move move out $600 million for promoting vaccination, supporting vaccination efforts in Indian country, down, down payment, right? But really important to say resources need to follow values. You know, $2 billion to make sure the hospitals are gonna get reimbursed, providers will get reimbursed, a billion dollars to support contact tracing and mitigation. I think important, right? Because we have to be accountable, right? For where the resources go and that we are being responsive. And I think that is the work of the task force, accountability, right? And so once we say it's not okay, 
then we have to say, how do we hold the administration, but actually the government at every level and the whole of society, private sector, philanthropy and others, how do we hold accountability for advancing on health equity? And so I think as important as, you know, where we've landed as a task force with where our top priorities are and where our recommendations are, I think is saying, there is going to be accountability at the end of the day. Like, are we actually making a difference? And Mr. Joseph said that in that first phone call, right? He does not have the time to show up to spaces to just talk, right? It has to lead to action. And that's why I know I was particularly encouraged to see that 57% number for where we are. But obviously, again, more work to do. Thank you for that. Um, did you want to follow up with that on that, Victor? Or no, I think we, I think that was well covered, you know, as we move forward, this kind of. So this next question uh, is very much at the heart of what we are working to overcome in Indian country and in other communities, obviously, but for this space, it's American Indian, Alaska Natives. So both of you, a question to consider, understanding and healing historical trauma is at the heart of efforts to achieve health equity in the COVID-19 space for Native peoples. This may play out most profoundly in behavioral health and substance misuse. Has a task force and the administration examined these issues through this lens? Please, Dr. Neen. Oh, absolutely. I'm happy, happy to, to start. You know, um, as Mr. Joseph said, we we each month in our public facing meeting took a deeper dive in a topic we thought was just critical, imperative for us to focus on. And so, you know, one of our very early sprints was around behavioral health. Um, and importantly, right, and understanding that it that encompasses kind of a wide spectrum of mental health conditions and also importantly, you know, substance use disorder. And we've seen a tragic rise in terms of um, the, the rates of substance use disorder and all the, the negative sequelae, including um, loss of life that can follow. Uh, and that sprint, as with everyone, every single one of those sprints, you know, Mr. Joseph was centered very much on, you know, communities that are often invisible, right? AIA and communities often not visible, often even in data systems, not visible in policy conversations and understanding, you know, of course, those spaces where we are, you know, shared in the, in the, in the way that problems land in our communities and shared in the way that it impacts us, but also where there is unique consideration. Um, and I think every time reminding us, Mr. Joseph, about funding promises um, that have not been realized and kept, right? And how critical that's gonna be. Again, the flow of resources needed to address these issues in, additional, in addition to the cultural responsiveness that we need to do the tailoring and the targeting to get to every single community. So let me just add that to the list of things I'm very grateful uh, to Mr. Joseph for, for bringing that perspective um, in, in, a, in an unapologetic way every time. Thank you, doctor. You know, Stacey, I, we all know what historical trauma has done to our people as they go through uh, just a tremendous amount of uh, grief over the several years since for a long time. I, I think about yesterday and what Canada was trying to do, you know, in recognizing all the children and survivors of residential schools, creating a national day of, uh, for truth and reconciliation of the native people, taking the first step as a nation saying, hey, something went wrong, we did wrong here. And we need to, that's the beginning of our healing process. Uh, that needs to take place. But those are the areas that are some of the root causes for the health disparities that we now face. And when we look at behavior health and substance abuse disorders, those are right in line with what we have experienced as people. And there isn't one native person, American Indian, Alaska native, that hasn't been impacted by the residential or boarding schools. We all have. 
I've been, and, and that was through my grandmother. And in fact, I was thinking this morning about this. The only time I ever seen my grandmother cry was when she was telling me why she didn't teach me how to speak our language. The only time. She had lost grandchildren, she had lost children, but we'd never seen her mourn for that. But that moment in time, I watched her cry. It still breaks my heart today. So that's some of the historical trauma that we carry and, and move forward. And the only way that we are gonna be able to move forward with this is one for our nations to recognize they did wrong. Two, we have a lot of healing to do. And in order to do healing, there's resources that we need and the federal government needs to keep up with their trust responsibility in providing that healthcare that we so desperately need, including the expansions of behavioral health, ours, mental health and substance abuse. We know COVID-19 has impacted those with mental health the most. A lot of times they didn't have the mental awareness to know what they're dealing with and created other problems. Substance abusers uh, also were transmitting the disease quite a bit. We know these things about COVID-19. So they were on the top of some of the highest on the infection rate, hospitalization, hospitalization and even deaths as we are moving forward. And as we continue to look at this, we need to really understand that there has to be a change in this area. As I look at specifically behavior health and substance use, I was so glad that that was part of our topic and we really focused down on it. And some of the things that are needed are those funding for those type of facilities that are gonna be able to help our people. But it's not just with our people, right? And so there's other people that are doing this too. And so we were trying to bring that all together and making sure that people with behavioral health disorders, mental health, or substance abuse are having equal access to care. And that it, the stigma should not apply to them. We still know that the stigma around native people and alcoholism is still there. And some of our providers still carry that prejudice with inside them. And so, those are issues that we dealt with on this task force that I'm really hopeful that we're going to see some positive results. Dr. Smith, New Smith, you want to follow up on that one? Uh, I um, I just thank you, Mr. That's all I can say right now. It's just I thank you and. Um, and I thank you especially for your patience with so many of us um, who are coming to the realities that, that you have shared with us in public meeting and in subcommittee and in, in minor meeting and, um, and that kindness that you have shown, right? As so many, uh, as you bear witness to these, these deep harms uh, and yet remain engaged and collaborative and hopeful with, with us. And I, I just, I am incredibly moved by that. And thank you for your grace. Yeah. And as a person on that task force who is speaking for American Indians and Alaska Natives, he's carrying that suffering with him into the room to speak that truth and all of us are grateful for that. Our native concepts of healing and health rely on tradition, culture, language. And when you have a 100 year investment to erase that, we have a long way to go toward healing. So we're grateful that the task force is cognizant of it, picked it up. And uh, we look forward to seeing those recommendations at the end of the month. I'm gonna move on to a different topic right now. We have about five minutes left. And right now folks are very concerned about um, vaccinations and uh, 
for tribes, we've led the nation in getting vaccinations out to our communities, including non-tribal community members. My own tribe was very, very good at that. I went to my tribe to receive my vaccination. I couldn't get access to it here. I live in the DC area. So we took the trip to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to get the vaccine. And it was very informative to see our tribe also, like many, many others, reaching out to our community and the and the greater community that is non-native to ensure vaccinations. Because disease, of course, doesn't understand boundaries. The reservation may end, but that disease is going to travel how it will. So, you know, there are many factors that drive vaccine hesitancy and vaccine refusal. So Dr. Nunez Smith, in your role as a senior advisor on the COVID-19 response team, how have you worked to advance vaccine access and confidence in the vaccine program? And Chairman Joseph, I'll follow up with you. Yeah, yeah you know, this has been, um, you know, just a huge part of the work. I thank you for that question for the, the White House COVID-19 response team. I mean, how grateful are we all to have uh, the vaccines in the first place? And, you know, I think that that is just a tremendous feat of science um, and to have vaccines with the profiles that they do in terms of effectiveness, how well they work and the safety profiles. I mean, I've been a practicing physician for you know, two decades plus um, and it's rare to see vaccines with this performance. And so that's tremendous, but then you know, vaccines never save lives, vaccinations do. And so the, the campaign making sure access uh, is there from the beginning and that's been a core principle. Um, and making sure vaccines are easy to obtain, um, free of charge, and they, they continue to be, that's inclusive of boosters, right? Continue to be free provided by the US government. And so that's very important, necessary and insufficient, right? To your point, Stacey, it has to be about having confidence. And um, you know, one of the truths I think that has to be spoken as well is that, these very same institutions, right? The, the medical institutions, the scientific enterprise, the US federal government, right? Have not always proven trustworthy. And so it is, it, 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 I, I don't think it's far-fetched at all to see it as rational for, for many people, particularly in AIN communities to pause and say, I, I'm not, Sure, right? The confidence isn't gonna come by virtue of these institutions um, offering the vaccine. And so the partnerships have been key and continue to be so. And you know, thank you, Stacey, and thank you to NIHB, I mean, for the leadership here, because it is about being sure that the messages resonate. And that's of course about cultural linguistic responsiveness, but more than that, right? Having messages that acknowledge these truths um, and that are delivered by the messengers, people know have their best interest at, at heart. And so, you know, again, from the federal government, the levers that are there have to do with things like resource distribution, um, and we've leaned into that, but also in resource flow to support those people who have always been there, who've always been in community and not showing up now um, and not showing up singing one song, right? Because people have many needs that we were just talking about. So to show up saying, I am here in the face of, you know, dire poverty, or I'm here in the face of community violence, or I'm here in the, in the face of, you know, lack of running water. But what I'm trying to make the top priority now is a vaccine, right? I mean, so being able to really meet people where they are um, has been the work and continues to be the work. I mean, we were very grateful in the transition to have for the, the expertise of so many, but including, you know, Dr. Jim from Navajo Nation to help us think through the early phases of the strategy in terms of a vaccination campaign and outreach and engagement um, and continuing on that. So, you know, it, I, I think it's wonderful to have seen the vaccine and vaccination uptakes really leading the way and modeling for the rest of the country. How you do that, how do you think about prioritization, reaching out to elders first, you know, preserving wisdom, everything, just a great model for us moving forward. Awesome, great. You know, we at the National Indian Health Board also, we have a campaign called Act of Love it's our effort to depoliticize um, things like wearing a mask and getting a vaccine because we believe they are acts of love, acts of love to our family, to ourselves, to our community, 
and in the simplest of terms and the lowest common denominator of what that truth of a vaccination is, of wearing a mask, washing your hands, they're acts of love. So, um, Victor, Chairman Joseph, do you want to follow up? When we, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> when we look at vaccinations and, you know, when we look at it through Indian country, when we start thinking about the distribution of the vaccines and how they were being received, there were some hiccups there, but overall it went out pretty good and people were getting uh, their vaccines. Our rural communities, our tribal communities, specifically our tribal communities had a higher rate of vaccination rates than uh, maybe the urban settings and and that was kind of concerning. And when I, in, in talking with Ed yesterday and, and over the last couple of days regarding vaccinations, because we had some concerns here and I'll share with you in a minute why, was, uh, you know, overall throughout the nation and with American Indian and Alaska Natives, there's about a 50% population of um, Native people that are vaccinated. But that also means there's 50% of Native people not vaccinated. And, and that should be really concerning to us. And then when we think about our communities that may have a high rate of vaccination, 70 to 90%, uh, when they come to communities that have a low rate, then they're putting themselves at risk, especially with the new Delta variant and knowing that that uh, virus can still be transmitted to people that have been vaccinated and people are still getting sick of that and being lost. Saying that, knowing that 90% of the unvaccinated people are now being, uh, that are being hospitalized are unvaccinated, at least that's the numbers here that are locally, that's taken up tremendous space. And in fact, the hospital here in Fairbanks has changed their, uh, their meeting rooms to response rooms. And so where they can be treating people. And then we start thinking about that. I also start worrying about a recent letter as our hospitals are now reaching capacity are over, well, let me restate that, now reaching are exceeding their capacity capability. And, and that's really concerning because that in itself, and as we talked about earlier, Stacy, was that creates that, crisis of standard of care and where hospitals are going to have to decide, providers are going to have to decide who's, good, who's the most likely to survive. And then you start looking at that and you say, well, what group of people have the highest health disparities? And that's going to be one of those measurements. And we know people with other health disparities are going to be less likely to survive than those with none, no other health disparities. And so our tribal people have a high rate of health disparities and they're gonna be impacted by this uh, policy change. And we need to be making sure that we are not impacted negatively on that. So I wanted to get into that a little bit and, and because that's really concerning. Two of our hospitals and, and, and nationwide people are starting to look at, hey, we might have to incorporate this policy in our communities and if that does, it's gonna impact people and more people are more likely gonna be passing. And so of this virus. So I, I wanted to share that and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Chairman Joseph, that was the last word. So that you have the last, last word in this, in this esteem. <laughs> so much more. Conversation. You get the last word, but we are all looking forward to this report. We're all very, very grateful for the work both of you are doing and have done. And thank you so much for your generosity of sharing your time with us today. It means a lot to those who are registered for this conference and whoever will see this will be uplifted by it, I am sure. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. One thing, Dr. Nuna oh. Smith, it's been a pleasure. And it is. You're not getting rid of me, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.